know precisely where or when mankind first appeared on this planet. We don't know our age, but recent evidence indicates that we may have been born here, all of us, in the heart of tropical Africa. For a long time, we could only guess what creature had made these earliest known tools. But in 1959, this puzzle, the skull in conjunction with stone tool attributes of a human being. If we follow the anthropologist's definition of man as the tool-making animal, then this indeed was man, and his home was Africa. A priceless formula. The techniques for smelting iron. Armed with iron spear and iron hoe, the Nubian of Meroe was able to trade and conquer far and wide among the surrounding peoples of the Western Sudan. The African Sudan is a belt of grassland and woodland and medium rainfall about half the size of the United States, stretching from the Atlantic coast across the continent to the highlands of Ethiopia, isolated on the south by great rainforests, and on the north by the vast desert of the Sahara. But the Sahara was not always the fierce and impenetrable wilderness it appears today. In early Neolithic times, it enjoyed rainfall enough to support both humans and livestock. And as early as 1500 BC, local populations were crossing it. We know this from rock carvings and paintings which seem to mark a scattered trail through the desert. Later, these early caravan routes, penetrating southward from the Mediterranean coast, were extended by Arab merchants, who, during the Middle Ages, established trading centers in the western Sudan, particularly in the region of a formidable African kingdom named Ghana. The Ghana of medieval history occupied a site several hundred miles north of its modern namesake, directly between the Arab merchants and the goal they had come so far to seek. Trade in gold was a Ghanan state monopoly. At one time, the king of Ghana was reported to own a nugget of gold large enough to tether his horse to. Ghana was, in reality, a confederation of clans or tribes bound together by family ties and a common language. After several hundred years, the confederation was weakened by internal dissension, which led finally to warfare and the dissolution of the kingdom. But out of this conflagration rose a new leader who created a Sudanese state even more dazzling than Ghana itself. This famous monarch was Sundiata, founder of the great medieval kingdom of Mali. Sundiata and his successors as Mansa, emperor, were converts to the Muslim faith. Under Sundiata, such great centers of learning as Timbuktu attracted scholars from every part of the Muslim empire from Spain to Baghdad. Ghana and Mali were certainly not the only African kingdoms which flourished during the Middle Ages, but we know most about these through their early contacts with the Arab world, who not only persuaded them to a new religion, but carried their fame to the distant nations of Europe. At about the same period as Sundiata's reign in Mali were created some of the major glories recovered by African archaeology, the superlative life-size portrait heads from Ife, far to the southeast in Nigeria. How these 13th century Africans learned the techniques for casting bronze, or from whom, we have no clear idea. But learn it, they did, and produced masterpieces that rank beside the classic works of Greece and Rome. Evidently, some of these portraits were originally adorned with lifelike hair and beard, for we see the holes by which the hair was attached to the statue.
rarest of all because so fragile is Ife sculpture in terracotta, contemporary with the building of Gothic cathedrals in medieval Europe. During this period, a bronze caster from Ife was imported 100 miles southward to the city of Benin to work exclusively for the monarch of that kingdom. Today, these Benin bronzes are famous in museums all over the world. Probably best known are the Benin plaques showing rulers, warriors, and retainers cast in high relief. Originally, these handsome, beautifully detailed pieces decorated the king's palace courtyards. They were remarked upon by many travelers of the time, about contemporary with the final days of the Aztec and Inca empires in the Americas. The Bini were also marvelous workers in ivory. Their skill went into small carvings called belt masks, which the Oba, or king, wore suspended at his waist on ceremonial occasions. Here, a leopard's head with brass spots. These delicate and perishable pieces are among the rarest of African antiquities. A mere handful remain intact. In the 18th century, another neighboring people rose to prominence, carrying forward the art traditions of ancient Ife. This was the kingdom of Ashanti. The Ashanti were among those people who gave the Gold Coast its name. Superlative goldsmiths, their trade in the precious metal brought them to the attention of the Portuguese. This magnificent amulet, hollow cast of unalloyed gold, was worn by the official guardian of the king's soul. It shows strong European influence. The Ashanti legacy is most famous in the form of small brass figurines, which, though but a few inches high, are often of monumental sculptural proportions. The gold weights are astonishing feats of technology. They were made by the casting process called cire perdu, or lost wax a highly sophisticated technique which accounts for their beautiful structural detail. Only a profound love of craftsmanship could have motivated the Ashanti casters to lavish so much effort on these tiny pieces. Because for all their artistry, they served a purely utilitarian function. They were standard scale weights used by Ashanti merchants and smiths for the weighing of gold dust. Ashanti Don Quixote, nobly astride his decrepit Bozanante. The weights were frequently fanciful. A monkey stealing coconuts. An alligator with a fish in its mouth. Sometimes they were utterly realistic. A bird claw cast directly from life. A shanty humor often runs to witty caricature. Here, a mother totes her youngster under her arm, like a doll. A pipe-smoking musician beats his drum with the curved sticks typical of that part of Africa. portrait and an unusually dyspeptic monarch lead one to believe the Ashanti kings were not completely immune from ridicule. Nearby, the Yoruba people, culturally related to the kingdom of Ife, have preserved the ancient Nigerian realism and literal mode of expression into modern times. Despite its size, 
This four-foot equestrian figure is actually part of a ceremonial headdress mask. It weighs approximately 50 pounds and represents an armed warrior with his attendants. A superbly beautiful Yoruba carving shows a worshiper of Shango, the thunder god, carrying her child upon her back. It's about 100 years old. A classic Galadi mask representing a Muslim priest probably comes from the hand of Alamide, one of the finest Yoruba carvers of this century. The opposite stylistic extreme is represented by several other groups to the north in the central Sudan. The Dogon people are supreme in the art of abstraction. This huge Baga yoke mask is also a striking example of geometrical abstraction. It depicts Nimba, the goddess of increase. One of the most important groups producing abstract art are the Bambara people, justly renowned for their highly stylized antelope headdress masks called Chiwaras. <laughs> A totally different tradition of African art has had its development elsewhere. In this mask from Angola, we see a full flowering of the abstracted grotesque. Much of this type of art is associated with medicine figures called fetishes. Their appearance is frequently awesome, but considerably less terrifying when we realize that here the eyes are made of 12-gauge shotgun shells. Medicine figures represent the supernatural, the power to heal, to destroy, to prophesy the future, to influence natural and human affairs. Their potency is often enhanced by the attachment of animal charms, bones, hair, and teeth. Nail figures of this type from the Congo derive special power from the pieces of iron driven into them. Iron, because of its magnetic qualities, has often been assigned magical significance through the ages. Mirrors, too, are frequently invested with mysterious power as they visibly capture the spirit of the beholder. In addition to their wizard powers, these figures are sometimes powerfully effective art as well. This, from the Bavile people, is one of the finest of its type. appreciate a ceremonial mask such as this, we must remember that it was not intended as a wall decoration. It was meant to come alive.
mask is intended to transform the person who wears it into something he is not in ordinary life. This comes from the Basangi people near Lake Tanganyika. A very unusual dance mask from the Bakota people of the Guinea coast is called Mabuto. The wearer represents an evil spirit who must be placated with prayers and sacrificial offerings. This Bavile mask comes from the same people who produced the nail figures. The arts of abstraction are by no means confined to one people. This highly abbreviated face comes from the Congo. And this from Nigeria was carved only a few years ago. Odd as it may seem to Westerners, to many Africans, the color of death is white, which is used in many garments and accessories associated with ancestor worship. This Igbo cult mask is one of the finest examples. The superlatively abstract brass reliquary figures of the Bakota are well known. They have exerted considerable influence on 20th century European painting. So to us, their style seems quite modernistic. Although virtually two-dimensional, these objects are not real masks, but a type of burial offering mounted on a box which contains the ancestor's bones. Although famed for their large circular dance masks, the Baluba of the Congo are also master sculptors in three dimensions. Here, a chief's stool is supported by a female figure with intricate hairdo and elaborately scarified torso. Scarification, deliberately scarring the skin with decorative designs, is a mark of beauty and prestige at least as old as ancient Ife. But we must be very careful in trying to apply our own aesthetic standards to the arts of Africa. Even the most beautiful of these objects is made to be used ceremonially, magically, or practically. However, it sometimes happens that African art survives the amputation of its traditional roots. This can produce devitalized work we call tourist art, but it can also result in magnificently sensitive design an exquisite ivory salt cellar dating from the 16th century. It was carved by the Sherbro people for the Portuguese and incorporates both European and African tastes. In the present century, an Ibibio artist named Umana shows the influence of his European teaching in this powerful decorative mask. But even more striking is the degree of influence exerted by African art upon some of the foremost modern artists of the West. Sculpture this Temne ancestor figure had obvious appeal to French artists like Maillot and Matisse. Modigliani, who created his famous portraits around the time of World War I, was very likely affected by such almond-shaped Balwalwa masks as this from the Congo. There are few 20th century artists of the stature of Pablo Picasso, and in one of his most famous paintings, The Three Musicians, he displays the debt of cubism to such African sculpture as this Bambara door latch, adorned with a highly cubistic human head. African culture has had immensely more impact on our lives in the West than most of us realize. The art, the music, and the peoples of Africa have given the world much. How much, we are only now beginning to appreciate. 
Recently, in the University Museum, Dr. Froelich Rainey interviewed world-famous archaeologist and anthropologist L.S.B. Leakey, discoverer of man, the toolmaker in Africa. Dr. Rainey asked Dr. Leakey what, in his opinion, was Africa's greatest gift to the West. Well, first and foremost, uh, Western man wouldn't exist without Africa. Uh, people say to me, what has Africa given the world? And I say, well, he gave him you and me, first of all. And later, he gave other things. But for the first, at least, one and a half million years, Africa dominated the world. Everything came out of Africa. After that, as people moved out of Africa and started redeveloping in, in subsidiary centers, then you've got centers of civilization elsewhere. But the first, earliest things in all Africa, and Africa gave the world man. What more can you give? 